Pop Up Flamby's Advent Calendar. Oh, I, a, 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 ha, he, he. Good morning, fellow mathematicians. Welcome back to the Advent Calendar. What do beer foam, soap, and a bunch of dyes all have in common? This is what we are going to find out today exactly. And I'm going to present to you one of my most favorite and most surprising physics experiments. Yes, it has to do with dice. That connects right to mathematics too. My students really like it. I love it too. And even though throwing dice is completely random, it all works out each and every year once again. And really helps my arguments in physics. So let us dive right in. Now here are the rules and they are very simple. I have an Excel table here and I have around 100 die, dice. Um, some are missing, really doesn't matter. I'm gonna count them together at the very end. The rules are simple. I'm going to roll all of those dice. And those are a lot. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take all the sixes out, for example, each time a die says number six, I'm going to take it out. You can also do it with number one, two, three, four, five. Really doesn't matter. But I'm going to go with the lucky number six because 69 starts with a six. And then I'm going to count all the remaining dice. And then I'm going to roll all of the remaining dice again. Every time it shows a six, they are out. Got to roll them again and again and again up until all of them are gone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count all the remaining dies after each and every throw and I'm going to count the number of throws and I'm going to start right here. This is going to take a while, bear with me. With a bunch of students it's way easier. Everyone has like three dice and then you are going to roll but for me it's going to take a while. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, now this took quite a while, but I got it done. The last one is done. I had 90 dice in total, and now I'm going to plot the curve and I'm going to do something else. So give me one more second. I am done with all the statistics stuff and here is where the fun truly begins. This part is fun for the students, <laughs> but now here's the fun for the maths and physics teacher. If you take a look at my data, I'm going to present it here. This is how the dice behaved. Basically what is going to happen is the number of dice gets smaller and smaller over time. Now interestingly enough, what you're going to notice if you take a look at the curve, for example, this might seem familiar to do. This might seem familiar to you. This looks either hyperbole or exponentially. Now, what is also quite interesting, if you take a look at the data once again, is that I put another column next to it that roughly every four throws, and that's not a coincidence, not at all, this happens all the time, that after kind of a set number of throws, the number of dice halves in two. Now, isn't that quite interesting? On the one hand, our graph looks like a exponential decay in some way. It's a decreasing function exponentially. We also get some kind of asymptote right at a y being equal to zero. But other than that, the number of dice also halves for each and every set iteration, in my case, after each and every four throws, roughly. And this is what you want to take a look at. And now we are going to go over to the blackboard and we are going to do some mathematics, shall we? Now we are going to go in completely raw. The only thing we have seen is our data, some rough estimations, and also we can make a wild and educational guess, namely that our function behaves in an exponential manner. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that our function f of x looks like, well, we don't know how the exponential function is stretched. So we are going to say there's a stretch, stretching factor n involved times a to the x with an arbitrary base a that we don't know anything about right now and a stretching factor n where x is our unknown. But we know a bunch of things about our data. Namely, what we know is the number of dice at the very start. So x of zero 
is equal to 90. So y is equal to 90. That's our first set of points. And what we also know is that after each and every four throws, our number of dice roughly halves. So basically what is going to happen is if we have x being equal to four in our case, then we are going to get that the number of dice is going to be equal to four to five. Now, this was just a set of data that we used for 90 dice. But let's just say that this happens all the time. We are going to go in a tiny bit more abstract because we are on the math channel here, not in class. But we can just say that we start off with a number of samples n naught. That's our starting number. And after a certain amount of time, we are going to have half of it. Certain amount of time being at four. And this amount of time or number of throws, we are going to call T for now, capital T for throws. After a certain number of throws, this halves in two. Okay, and with that out of the way, our exponential function is actually uniquely determined. Let us plug everything in. So if we plug in x being equal to zero, we are going to get that f of zero is equal to n times a to the zero. The cool thing is that this right here is one, and this is equal to n naught. And this is not surprising at all that the starting value, the y-intercept of our exponential function is exactly the starting value, which we started with 90 dice in our case. So we are going to get that f of x for now is the same as n naught times a to the x. Now we are going to plug in our second set of coordinates. Now we are going to get that f of t is going to be equal to n not over 2. And this is equal to, well, we are going to get a not, this is our new equation, times a to the t. Okay, what we are going to do now is we are going to solve for our base a. Easy enough, we are going to divide both sides by a not, gonna cancel out. It's not equal to zero because we start with a certain value, 90 dies in our case, meaning we are going to end up with one half is equal to a to the t, where t in our case is 4 rows of the die and then we are going to have um, half of the number. So now we are going to take the teeth root of one half giving us our base as well one half to the one over t. Meaning overall what we did is we used a bunch of data we saw something and now we can actually formulate ourselves an equation which our data behaves by. It's an exponential one namely that f of x is equal to the starting value n naught times one half to the one over t or the t root of one half. Now, if you've ever done physics, this might seem a tiny little bit familiar to you, and it should, because it's a really famous equation. Also, I, forget, uh, I forgot that we have to the x power right here, <laughs> because we have the exponential function. Now this right here is a really famous equation and this is in connection to what I said at the very start. What does mere foam, soap and dyes all have in common? What they work by is exactly the rules of the exponential decay for radioactive isotopes. If you have a certain number of isotopes, and this is a really unexpected part for students, let's say 30,000 plutonium isotopes, then what is going to happen is they have a certain half-life. This half-life is defined as the time it takes for the number of samples to half in two for each and every iteration. This is what we did right here now. Our dice that we had and not 90 dice were our radioactive isotopes in the model. And after a time of four throws, basically, our number of dice is going to half in two, roughly, each and every time. 90, then 45 roughly after four throws, and then 22 roughly after four throws, and so on. And this right here, is exactly the equation for the exponential decay for radioactive isotopes. That's the decay equation. We are going to reformulate this a tiny little bit more such that you can see that it is what you maybe have learned in physics. And it works the same with beer foam or if you take a bath and you have foam in there. What is going to happen is at the very start you are going to have a lot of foam, a lot of dyes, whatsoever. And obviously the probability that they are going to 
be picked out and leave or the foam is going to go down. It's kind of high because they have a lot of foam bubbles and each and every foam bubble has a certain probability of bursting. And each and every die also has a certain probability, one six, of basically disappearing from the stack. But overall, it does make sense that if you have a lot at the start, they are going to decay faster. You are going to have more and more decay at the very start. But the less you have, the lower the probability that some of those are going to get picked out or some of those bubbles are going to burst. This is why you get uh, exponential decay. Like, it's a thing of probability. Statistically speaking, it's kind of random that stuff like this happens. But overall, it's also pretty deterministic because it does make sense that some of those dyes must disappear. Some of those isotopes, even though they decay spontaneously, what they are going to do is they are going to also behave deterministically. Namely, we know that something is going to happen to them. And what do we know about what is happening to them? Well, they decay with a certain half-life. And this is exactly what happens here with the dice too. And this is why I love this experiment, because it ties extremely into physics. And you can use something simple like dice to basically demonstrate something that happens on a microscopic scale that you can't even see. You can only feel it after a few years or a few months, whatever, if you were exposed to radioactive um, strahlung, <laughs> to radioactive rays, basically. Now we are going to reformulate this a tiny little bit and I hope you found this part a tiny little bit interesting where I explained a tiny little bit about radioactive decay. So what we are going to do is we are going to bring this into physics terms a tiny little bit. The so-called half-life is defined as being T one half. This is the time it takes for the amount of samples or isotopes to half in two. I also used a not. This is a regular notation that we use for the starting value of isotopes, basically. Also, as it always is with physics, everything acts under time, basically. So we are going to take the number of samples, number of isotopes, and it's dependent on the amount of time that has passed. So in radioactive terms and physics terms speaking, the function n of t for the radioactive decay looks as follows. We have n of t is equal to n not the starting value, times one half to the... Well, there is a fly or something in here. No, it's a mosquito. Holy hell. I'm leaving this in the video. That's, that's nice. And also by the exponentiation rules, we are going to get small t, so the time dependence divided by t one half, our half time. So t divided by t one half. But we can do better than that. Physicists and also mathematicians love to work with the natural exponential function using Euler's number as the base. So what we're going to do is to use a trick. We are going to take it to base e and exponentiate it to the natural log of what we have right here. So that's the same as saying we have n naught times e to the natural log of one half to the t divided by t one half. Okay, now by using logarithm rules, we can bring the t over t one half to the outside. And the logarithm of one half is the same as negative the log of two, because two is the, uh, one, one half is the same as two to the negative one. So we can track the negative one to the outside too. So this right here can be written as n of t, is equal to, and then we have n naught times e to the negative log of 2 divided by our half-life, t1 half, times t. And this is what you are going to find in your literature for the decay equation of isotopes. And that's cool, right? I mean, we can trace it back from this experiment just like we did before with the... Um, with the um, capacitors, for example, we did the same thing. We traced it back to, back to a basically exponential decay, which is very nice. And also this right here satisfies a certain differential equation. We all know what it is. If we were to differentiate what we have here, then we are going to get that the differential in our number of isotopes with respect to time is going to be equal to if we differentiate our exponential function, we are going to drag this constant negative log of 2 divided by t1 half to the front. So we are going to get negative log of 2 divided by the half-life times and not times e to the negative log of 2 divided by t1 half times t. And you are going to notice something. This right here is nothing other than our original function n of t. 
And this right here is a certain constant negative lambda. This right here is our radioactive decay constant, I think it's called. But nevertheless, whatever it's called, we are going to get the differential equation that the time derivative of our number of isotopes is equal to negative some constant lambda times n of t. What this just means is that the change of our um, particles over time is equal to a scaling factor times our original number of particles, basically. This is all that it really says. And this right here is usually the differential equation that you are going to deal with when you start with university. And that's like a thing that you always do there. I had to do the beer foam experiment at university where I had to show exactly this, but with beer foam instead of dye and dyes. And <clears throat> well, I had to also solve this differential equation, which is easy enough. You just integrate both sides up after separating. But I hope you did enjoy what you have seen today. And if you did, uh, I also hope you enjoyed the advent calendar up until now. And up until the next video, I wish you guys a flammable day. See ya!